all kind of uh, uh, visual imagery related to the Dalit movement, but more importantly related to Tara is frozen on my screen. Hello. Who's that? 
Hello. Hello, I can hear you. You can hear me? Okay. So I my the light has gone out and I <laughs> it was disturbed. How are your okay. lights? Okay. Yeah, electricity gone. Oh, there are so many obstacles. Okay. Let me continue now. You know, uh, dear uh, friends, I was saying that uh, uh, the emergence of uh, art in the form of painting, statues, matches, calendar is one of the important features uh, of the post ambedkar moment. And uh, we have tried to understand the literature. Sit down we, are not, <laughs> we, are not, we have not tried to understand the uh, Dalita. It's what Gary Karpata, who really uh, I really studied it and brought to our notice. What does Dalit art mean? What does Buddhist art and imagery mean? Uh, what is the content? What is its significance? And uh, uh, he spent a number of years. He was motivated by Elinor Zeliet and Vasan Moon. So he traveled to uh, most of the part of Maharashtra, Pune, Aurangabad, Nagpur, and he went inside the houses of the Dalits and took the photograph, he may have thousands of photographs. And based on that understanding, he uh, wrote several articles uh, on the meaning of uh, Dalit art and imagery, Buddhist art and imagery. And uh, most one important thing is that he studied the Hindu temple and also brought to a notice that as to how this temple also contains, contains, contains the symbols of fascism and caste system as such. Well, I won't take uh, much of your time but the entire writing of uh, Dr. Tarkatao, lifetime writing on Dalit art and imagery, has been put into a book called Dalit Art and Visual Imagery, which was published by uh, Oxford. Now, that book is now a remarkable book, which has documented the, uh, the entire story of Dalit art and Buddhist imagery uh, in India. Uh, it, has, it has established that discipline. Uh, with this remark, uh, um, I now invite uh, Dr. Gary Torkato uh, to share uh, his journey of how he has studied uh, Dalit art and imagery. What does Dalit art and imagery mean? Uh, what what message it is conveying, and uh, the significance of this art? Dr. Gary Torkato. Dr. Gary Torkato uh, lives in Massachusetts, uh, 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 with his wife, who is sitting behind Caroline. And you see, see his partner in, in the anti anti racial movement and and the anti discriminatory movement in USA. Dr. Gary, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very clearly. Okay. Uh, but we we don't have the slide as yet. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Um, what I'm going to do today is to tell you what it was like to come from. The United States as someone who knew nothing about Dr. Ambedkar or the movement and to discover them as I was there. Uh, when the Diksha took place in 1956 in Nagpur, I was a high school student in Los Angeles. I knew about India. I knew about the Taj Mahal. I'd heard the word untouchable, but I didn't know much else. At the university, I ended up in a graduate school studying the history of art, particularly India and the early culture of Hindu and Buddhist temples in India. Uh, in 1963 and then 66, I came to India and spent a year moving from place to place studying the art of early Hindu and Buddhist things in Maharashtra and in Tamil Nadu and in Karnataka. Uh, at that point, I still was not doing much like Dr. Ambedkar. I did have a social uh, and I wanted to explain what was the closest to the situation in my world. In the 1950s in the US, we had on television, on the news regularly, the struggle of African Americans for an equal place in American society. And that struggle went on daily, and we got to watch it. Here you see a picture of the slums outside of Washington, D.C., in the view of the Capitol. You can see the D.C. Capitol in the back there. The big issue in the middle 1950s 
was going to school. All right, here's a young woman trying to go to school, being harassed by an entire crowd of white people. And that was the problem we had in our country, and we certainly understood that those of us who wanted to see democracy develop. While I was in India studying Hindu temples and Buddhist viharas, I had the occasion to drive between Aurangabad and Ajanta. You all know the famous Buddhist, wonderful Buddhist vihara site at Ajanta. And at Harsul, just on the edge of Aurangabad, I found this interesting image. I didn't know what it was. It looked like something uh, from a book I'd seen popular art in the US called Pop Art. So I went up close and there was an inscription which you can see down near the bottom. It said, Bodhisattva Ambedkar. This image was put up in 1962. It is one of the first images of Ambedkar anywhere in India. And it's in many ways a model for all later images of Ambedkar. You see him in his Bombay lawyer's uniform. Blue suit, white shirt, red tie, and pens in his pocket. I don't know if you can make them out. I don't know that I saw them the first time. But as time went on and I studied other images, those pens became quite clearly important. Later in my life, I was able to study the imagery of Ambedkar as spread across India. This image is even earlier in 1962. It's in Mumbai, uh, the Cricket Maidan, next to the, what was the Institute of Science. Uh, it's a wonderful image. This may be the first public image of Dr. Ambedkar uh, by a man named Rameshwar Rad, who worked for the British and worked for the Indian government, made images of every great viceroy, and he knew Ambedkar personally. And I talked to him about it, and he really had warm feelings for Ambedkar. So he felt this feeling, image was one of his very best. And you see him there in that Bombay lawyer's uniform. Some people call it Western, you know, but it's been in Bombay as long as it's been in Los Angeles. So, and there is Ambedkar in the pose of a Roman general lecturing his troops. One hand behind his back, hand out. In 65, Wag made a second image that went into the Lok Sabha ground in Delhi. And this time he had the book that we saw earlier, the book that we normally see with Ambedkar and the pose of the Roman general. So there is Ambedkar seeking to instruct the nation clearly with the constitution under his arm. The Ambedkar we've all come to know so well. And if you got up close, you can see even in the bronze, little pen in his lapel pocket. There's a park sized image of the same, also by Wong, at Columbia University in New York. We all remember that Ambedkar got his first doctoral degree in economics at Columbia University, one of the finest universities in the United States by any measure. And uh, after his work on the Constitution, uh, he was brought back and celebrated, certainly. And this image went in eventually to the library, to one of the libraries at Columbia. What I want to talk to you about mainly is how pictures are used, how images are used, how art, right? visual images are used. Uh, here are three of our Dalit friends visiting that image in Colombia. We went to see it, I went with it. The man on your left in the white suit, Rahul Deepankar, is a doctor from UP, who now is a doctor in Bourbonnais, West Coast of Chicago. Um, um, Deepankar still goes back and forth between the US and India. He has sponsored a school for girls in his home village in UP. On any case, him going to see, and the other dog is going to see that image, it sort of fills them with pride and reminds them of what Dr. Ambedkar had done. And as I just told you about Dupankar's school, and he's contributed to political causes in different ways. This is what we can all do, right? Ambedkar isn't just there to worship, he is there to imitate, to become Ambedkar's ourselves. But not just Indians go to see the image, 
here's Ellen Lynch, a fine anthropologist who worked with Dalits in uh, oh, the south of Delhi, uh, in the town of the Taj Mahal in Agra. Uh, Owen also taught in New York City, lived near Columbia, and this is Owen Lynch visiting that image. But you can see has flowers because, of course, people have come to see it regularly. And whether we do it all the time in America, we do this with Indian images that we do at home in India. We make no flowers. This image is a bust also. It's made in concrete. It's at Mahimapur in Amravati district. This is from Dr. Carl's home village, which we visited one night back in 1988. We visited the night before this image was supposed to be unveiled, so they unveiled it specially for us. There are the villagers who saved their money up to purchase that image, so proud was they of Ambedkar, so important was he to stand for them. I mean, the fact was, untouchables were not supposed to be seen any more than heard or touched by the upper caste. But now with this image of Ambedkar, they're standing up in public and saying, I'm going to be heard, I'm here. Back in 1966, when I was first in India, this was the only image I could find of Ambedkar after I'd seen that one on the road, right? Uh, there were very few images. 1966, Ambedkar was known certainly in India, not known much outside of India, I don't think. But it was the only image I could find to bring home uh, a lithograph about this three, four, five inches tall, uh, one of a series of things that were available and useful, but again, quite small. And when we think of how many Ambedkar images there are around today, maybe more images of Ambedkar, if they say, than any other person in culture. Well, numbers aren't the most important thing. But how do we use those images? How does Baba Sahib stand for us when we have him in a picture? Uh, this is Vince Wada Wilson. A lot of you know Vince Wada Wilson. He's the head of the South Bank, Arm Chari Andalon in Delhi, that union of sanitary workers who are trying to get their own union expunged because they don't want to do the work they've been forced into doing. And Wilson has been the man so successful at taking their cause to the Supreme Court, and he still works at this around the world and certainly in India. And you'll notice behind Wilson's desk, there's a few words of Ambedkar and the picture, even if in a tiny little shape, in a tiny little shape, you can see that man you know, right? We use those words, we use that picture, prop ourselves up to remind us what we're doing. Here's the most recent image I have of Ambedkar. Let me go back a second and think about the tradition. Of course, this is Ambedkar with the Buddha behind him. This is the Bodhisattva Ambedkar with the Buddha, right, in his thought. And here is Gazwater Wilson with Ambedkar behind him. And here is Anand Kalkunde, who a lot of you know, who has been put in jail by the Modi government, but who is certainly a follower of Ambedkar, someone who is spreading the ideas of Ambedkar, uh, and has been arrested, charged with a false crime of that riot that was caused by Hindu, not Delhi, at Karagan. Well, we still use those pictures to tell us who we are, to tell us where we're going, to share with each other. Here's an image of Ambedkar. It's really my favorite portrait of Ambedkar. It's by T.B. Ronteki, an artist from Rangpur. I went to see Ram Teki in 88 because I heard he was a Dalit artist and I had heard of very few. Uh, and this is the image he made of Dr. Ambedkar, which uh, he then reproduced in lithographs so many people could have them. Uh, here's the kind of art that Ram Teki was doing uh, in his studio work uh, for the galleries. Uh, mostly his work was abstract, with lots of little figures and like, animals flying around, you can see birds here and little insects and things. But as I looked at it for a long time, I realized this was a Buddhist picture, right? In the middle of this gray scene, you see a white dome, right? And we all know from Nagpur, we know the Chachabumi, right? We know what a stupa is. At the very bottom, you can see symbols for the different Indian religions. You can see a red trishul for 
Hinduism, and you can see a cross for Christianity, and you can see a half moon for Islam. And they're all included in this white dome, which is called joy of unity. The point is we can all follow Buddhism in certain ways, and we can share the world around it. Uh, it's a powerful image, but it's very subtle. When I asked Ram Taki about it, he said, oh, no, no, it's not a Buddhist image. It's just a pretty design. I think his feeling was if you were too obvious, too open about what you were saying, too many people would be disappointed. Well, Dalits would have liked it, but those people who could afford to buy oil paintings uh, were not Dalits. Later, I met Sabi Stawarkar, also an artist from Nagpur. Really, Nagpur, as we all know, is produced a great deal. Uh, so our card is the first artist I was able to find, Dalit artist who gave his life to making images of the Dalit situation, of who Dalits were, of where they were. Uh, here's an image of Dalit in Maharashtra, back in the times of the Peshwa, when we know they were forced to carry small spittoons around their neck so that even their saliva wouldn't contaminate the ground that others would call contaminated. What a crazy idea, right? But the fact is they were forced to do it. This may be caricature the container larger than it had to be. Uh, but the fact is it existed. And Savi Sawarkar has probed it up and said, you know, we all have to see this. We have to remember this. We've been tortured in many ways. We go on being tortured and tell me. Right? We don't have to be. And imagery doesn't have to be just things that are decorative for the wall. This is Savi's masterpiece, or one of his great masterpieces. It's a print about a meter wide with all kinds of images. He's a modernist artist. He doesn't just do things that you can just read simply. He gives you all kinds of imagery that you have to find a way to interpret. So there are Dalits throughout his picture. I'll just focus on the one here, curled up, surrounded by other heads, wondering who he is next to this pot, right? There's that Maharashtrian Peshwa's pot upside down. And you've seen these before with the Namam on top and terrible image, right? Uh, and that's over on the side. This is actually a five-part image with one, two, three, four, five heads, right? Big black pot on your far right and a strange sheep that's hard to read but has the Brahmin's marks of Shiva, Shiva at the top and a Vishnu also. Three horizontal, two vertical, and then Dalits. And then there's that man in the mask, again asking us who we are, where we're going. Uh, Salvi is really quite amazing. Uh, and the point of this and bringing this to you is Salvi's art is known around the world, mostly in America, but certainly it's known in Europe as well, right? Here's a woman at an exhibit in Los, oh, this is an exhibit in Iowa. We've shown a set of pictures of Salvi's at a variety of American universities, at Columbia, at Brandeis, at the University of Massachusetts, University of Wisconsin-Madison, University of Iowa, Iowa State University, University of Massachusetts Amherst. And different people see that image and they wonder what the story is. And as you can see, there's text on either side so we can talk about it. Not just put up a picture and it's strange and who knows what it means. We've all seen that picture we can't figure out. But there's a guide. We use Savi's pictures here to tell people about the Dalit world, the world he comes from. And maybe one more, uh, just a more purely Buddhist piece, certainly a more Buddhist piece. It's called Arhat, right? And there's the enlightenment. Many of us, of course, have looked at Buddha images and seen that Ushnisha, that pop knot on the Buddha's head, that extra consciousness that grew there with his enlightenment. This is a sort of nuclear explosion of understanding. It's not a pretty picture, it's not decoration, right? The Arhat is not a pretty being. The Arhat is the Bodhisattva, it's the person, right? And this could be either gender, right? He's got you, a person becoming enlightened, looking for a way to Ambedkar also used and knew the use of pictures, how to use them. Here he is in 1927 visiting the soldier's monument at Corrigan, 
right? You can see him at the base of the monument with a group of associates. There are people from all castes. Most are Dalits, but there are people from every caste there, people who want to get rid of caste, certainly. And up behind him on the monument, you can see that white plaque where they list the soldiers, the Mahar soldiers in the Mahar regiment that helped defeat the Peshwa, right? And Ambedkar's meaning was not one should be at war, but one has to defend oneself that Mahars could go and be soldiers as much as anybody else, and that certainly they could stand up to the Peshwa. Uh, and in fact, people go every year to Corrigan. My wife and I have gone to Corrigan on January 1st to celebrate. This is December 31st, I think. Um, Baker started this event where we come and renew our commitment to each other, right? To make this change we all need to make. Now, here's an image that not many people know about. Take a look at our book, you'll see it. Dr. Ambedkar designed a Buddha image, right? And he had a man named Madelgacker sent to him by the Siddhartha College to make a portrait of him to go into their college hall. And he said, I don't need a portrait of me. You don't need a portrait of me. Uh, but it would be good to have an image of Buddha. And he gave Madelgacker some photographs and said, make one of these, which Madelgacker did. And then he came back a couple of days later and he said, well, do this, change this the way here, change the robe in this way, change the hands in this way. So Ambedkar um, participated in this design as it was made. So this is a Buddha image designed by Dr. Ambedkar. Um, uh, it's a very international Buddha image. It's got much the face of the Amaravati Indian type, but it has the robe that is popular in China and the Far East. You know, the fact that Dr. Ambedkar um, knew English and other international languages, as well as Hindi and Marathi and Indian languages, meant he could reach many different people. He's really, as you know, an internationally important Buddhist figure. And his struggle, the Dalit struggle, is part of an international struggle, as Buddhism is an international faith. Right? It's not just tied to India, although it's most important there. This image is that symbiosis where there is an Ambedkar Museum in Pune. Uh, there's another version of the same thing at Behu Road, where Ambedkar brought it to what was a temple being greeted by some adults, or by some Dalits, who asked him to bring an image, and he said, I'll bring you an image of the Buddha. Uh, this is what's happened more recently to that image of Ambedkar at Harsul, that first image. You can make it out up there with a hand at his side, and the book under his right arm. The fact is, in your country, like in mine, images can be the focus for praise, but they can also be the focus for vandalism as people struggle. You know we're struggling here to get rid of our pre-Civil War and post-Civil War anti-democracy slavery monuments. In the same way in India, we have monuments, monuments to different gods, and we have monuments to different people, and people struggle over them. Uh, now there's a cage built around the Ambedkar at our school to protect it from vandalism. Uh, but he's there for us all to see between Ajanta and Arangabad. That's an image I took from a museum in, uh, where are we talking about? From uh, a museum in Soweto, South Africa. It's a museum, an anti-apartheid museum. And it talks about the way that in apartheid South Africa, there were separate toilets for white people and black people. And of course, the black people, the Africans, had to clean the toilet. Uh, now at the museum in Soweto, they're saying things have changed, right? We know that the black population of South Africa has taken over its own country, which is a wonderful thing. But we also know that it's still ruled in many ways, although not politically, economically by foreign interests or European interests. And so they're struggling very much as in India. If in the United States, African Americans are about 12% of the population. In India, Dalits are about 17 to 18% of the population. In South Africa, the black South Africans are 95%, and yet they're still struggling to get control, to share in the wealth and the benefits of their nation. I brought that up because we're struggling with the same things in India, 
and around the world. This is the only picture I've ever taken of a woman in the street cleaning up. This is at Navaratri in Mysore, the great festival, right? And we all recognize that basket beside her. My wife and I were sitting in the crowd and we were shocked to see this one woman cleaning up for all these people to watch the parade. It was a frightening thing. I was embarrassed to take the picture, but I'm still more embarrassed by the fact that it exists, that anybody can be forced to do this kind of work. And we all have to know about it. In India, you know about it. In my country, we have to know about it too. We can't overcome it if we can't see it. Now, here's something we have locally, which I think you might find interesting. This is Sojourner Truth. She was an African-American abolitionist, African-American woman. Before our civil war, when slavery still existed, she walked away from slavery. She just walked away. <laughs> uh, and then she sued the slave owner to get her son back. And she was the first African-American to win a court case against the white person in America. And she worked for the end of slavery before the Civil War. And after the Civil War, she worked for women's rights and women getting the vote. Right? Sojourner Truth lived 15 miles from my home in Florence, Massachusetts. And we use the statue very much the way we use Ambedkar images at home. I, I have two homes, you'll have to say. We use them the same way. Here's John Bracey with that image. Once a year, we have a festival around that image where we give away scholarships to students who have been active on social justice who are working to change this world, the way Dalits are, the way Buddhists in India are, right? To make a world where it's safe and healthy for all of us. Uh, he's an African-American man. And one of the things I've been doing uh, because of my family and because of who I know here, but also because of what I've learned internationally, what I've learned in South Africa, what I've learned in England, what I've learned in the United States, but what I've learned in India, is there are people all over the world who've been criminalized, right? Who've been punished as if there was something wrong with them because an elite can use that criminalization to raise themselves up and to take advantage of everybody. That's our caste system in India. That's our race system in America. We use these pictures different ways. I'm fascinated by the fact that we really don't just let them be decoration. We use them. Uh, here's Dr. Torot himself. He didn't know I was going to use this picture. But here he is in his office in Delhi uh, with two scholars coming to learn about Dalit issues. Uh, we have this phrase in the United States, preaching to the choir. And we're always talking to our friends and people we share things with and not enough to those people outside who have to learn also. And it's true, we have to get beyond the choir, but it's also good to strengthen the choir, to learn more, to share ideas with each other. And here is Ambedkar talking to two young scholars. And you notice on his wall, there are pictures. The red picture over on your right, as you look at this, is one of Sabi Savarkar's picture of a Dalit. And above their heads are two of the great, great beings of our worldwide struggle for Human rights, right? There's Dr. Ambedkar in the middle on top, who you know. And next to him, that man who is in America, the American Ambedkar, right? MLK, you have BRA, we have MLK. Dr. King, right? Who didn't even reach his 40th birthday. None of us are going to be as important or as great as they were, maybe. Maybe someone hearing my voice will be inspired to become. But it needs all of us because they couldn't do this themselves. Behind Dr. Ambedkar, you see people. And around Dr. King, you'd see people in other pictures. The fact is we all have to be there doing what we can do, you know, raising this thing. I'm talking to you from America. You're in Nagpur, the center of struggle in India, one of many centers, but certainly the center at which Ambedkar came when he needed the diksha. Uh, here's what's going on in my country today. I'm back to television news. But it's news you know about. Black Lives Matter. Here are people, white people, black people, probably some Indian Americans, right, coming to protest in our cities saying that we have to change. Right? We talk about two pandemics now, the pandemic of COVID and the pandemic of criminalization of black people, right? In India, it's the criminalization of Dalits. Uh, around the world, there are people who are singled out and persecuted more 
just so you can have a hierarchy with some people on top to take advantage of everyone. So I'm bringing you our Black Lives Matter, you've heard of it, but it's an international struggle as you know. And I'll leave you with one last picture. Uh, I won't leave you, but I'll give you one last picture, uh, which I took in Baroda, you know, call it Vadodara, right at the MS University uh, back in the 90s. Uh, graduate student in the Department of Art and Design. And here is one of her designs. The elite's rights are human rights, right? We do this all over the world. Uh, and we use pictures and we use words. She's got a little design running across the top under the words. Uh, this is what pictures are for or what we can use them for, right? They can be just decoration, but they can also be signposts we use to remind ourselves of who we are and where we are going, right? We can be like targets. So that's my experience of Dalit things. Uh, next time I come to Nagpur, maybe I'll meet some of you. I've been in Nagpur, and my wife and I have been in Nagpur a couple of times. And uh, we've always enjoyed it and enjoyed people there, and we hope to come back again. So I hope this has been what you came to hear, because here we are in the same room, and I'm preaching to you, the choir. <laughs> and we can go further, too. But I'm glad you've had a chance to see what I've been doing, use pictures to bring out the Diksha and Dr. Ambedkar for all of us. Thank you, Gary. You can listen to me? I can hear you very well. I hope you can hear me. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, despite the uh, terrible technical problems, uh, you have been able to present uh, the nature of the Dalit art and painting and imagery. Uh, uh, I can only summarize by saying that uh, through the painting of Savi Savarkar and Ram uh, you have pointed out to us that those paintings uh, depict and present the miseries of Dalit uh, by drawing the experience from Peshwai, how they were required to hang the pot around their neck, how they were required to carry the broom around their back and carry a stick in their hand. Uh, so uh, the one of the one of the uh, feature of the Dalit art and imagery is that they bring out the miserable life of the Dalit. But there is other feature that you have brought out very clearly. I know you have a number of other photographs, but you brought out several photographs of Dr. Bauer Simon uh, The statues of Dr. Bauer Simon Now, the statue of Dr. Bauer Simon is, is an immense source of inspiration uh, for the Dalit. And you have uh, brought out the various aspects of it. Uh, you have also brought out uh, uh, the meaning of the, uh, the Buddha statue, which was designed by Dr. Bauer Simon uh, and donated to the to the uh, to the viharas in in pune in 1952 and dr Bhavasai had a particular idea of buddha he wanted buddha to be with open eye and hmm. see the reality and miseries around he doesn't want buddha to be to close his eyes buddha for 80 years walked uh, through the society saw the misery helped the people so that is what the image that Bhavasai wanted of buddha so you have brought out uh, the, the three basic points, I believe, in your uh, presentation. You have a large number of photographs. I know you have, you have not shown us. But the three features of the Dalit arts and imagery is that they present the situation of the Dalit through picture. It's the same way the Dalit poet presents through the poetry. And, but they have also goals. They aspire for equality. They aspire for fraternity and liberty. Uh, many of our, your painting, the painting that you have collected, uh, talked about uh, uh, the, the the goal of liberty. You know, the Buddha, the Bhikkhu statue by Savi Savarkar, a picture by Savi Savarkar, uh, uh, that brings uh, brings out, and the, it also brings out their struggle. Uh, so, all in all, you know, uh, you got a very limited time, but you have really given a test of what is Dalit art and imagery. I can assure you that when you come to Nagpur. Uh, Avaaz India TV will be very glad to have your full-length lecture with so many of uh, visuals uh, 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 you, will, you will share with them. I really thank you very much. Uh, I thank Karlai who was sitting there behind you. Uh, two important people engaged in the uh, emancipation of African-American and also helping hand for the Dalit. Well, thank you very much, Gary. Take care and take care of your health. Thank you.
Sorakse. Sorak, sir. Yeah. Uh, other two guests are also there with us. I'm just taking yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My 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 problem would be that uh, I don't have a light, so I will continue for another fifteen twenty minutes. But I'll make the beginning of the lecture and introductory remark. If the electricity comes, then I'll be with you throughout. Hello. 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 Hi. 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 How are you? Fine. How are you, Kevin? All right. Nice all right. <laughs> oh, I can see here Simon Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence yes. Simon. Yeah. 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 Kevin, yeah. Kevin, it's good, good to see you, too. It's good to see yeah. you, too. It's been a while. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We had a wonderful lecture by Gary Tofato on the Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, I heard a little bit of it just now. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, shall we begin? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Kevin is going to go first, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you are. Uh, you have everything in in place. You can you can see us, and your voice is clear. Yes. Is that okay? I can listen to you, both of you. I can see you. Perfectly fine. That's fine. Wait, okay. 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 Great. Okay. It's a little more light from here. Well, well. Let me begin with a profound thanks of uh, Kevin Brown and uh, Lauren Simon. Lauren Simon from Brandeis, uh, Boston City, and uh, Kevin Brown from Indiana uh, for sparing the time in, in this difficult time. Uh, they will uh, the the topic that we have uh, put up for their discussion. Uh, is race and caste, uh, the African American in USA and the rich in India, and how do they share the common destiny? Uh, that is a broad title, but uh, they they have a long experience of. The interrelation between the African American and the Dalit that have been built up over a period of time, uh, wherever possible, their uh, combined social struggle, uh, and at the end, you know what they can learn from each other, how they can build up the solidarity. I think these are some of the issues that they would like to, uh, they will discuss. I believe uh, I will only introduce them and introduce the theme for another ten minutes or so. Uh, then each one of them will have uh, about 30 minutes, and at the end, uh, if I am there because electricity is gone and we don't have other mechanism to charge the uh, laptop, uh, so uh, I will, we will summarize and have some uh, discussion, deep discussion at the end. But if I'm not there, I think uh, we will really end with the with the presentation by both. They can take a little more time then. Well, let me make an introductory remark uh, uh, first. That uh, you know, there has been a, uh, in the past a fairly close relationship between the African American movement and that of the Dalit movement. Uh, it has grown over a period of time. Its nature and dimension has changed. Uh, if we go back and look into the little history, what, what we can say. See that there is there, there is a similarity between the two. The African American or black has been the victim of slavery, the Jim Crow uh, for about a hundred years, where they were they were segregated, and at the present they are they continue to face the discrimination. On the other hand, in India, the Dalits continue to suffer from uh, untouchability and denial of equal rights. They also suffer from caste slavery. This is a recent thing that has come up now. And they continue to face the discrimination. So you can see an immense similarity between uh, between the African American and and the Dalit in so far as they suffered from slavery, uh, from segregation, and from the discrimination uh, where they continue to uh, suffer. The impact of this was very really horrible on them. I need not go into the greater detail. That they remain unsettled. They remain illiterate. They remain without civil rights. Uh, 
more hungry and high poverty and continue to face the discrimination uh, uh, in, in both cases. Uh, I'm not going into the statistics, but I will only briefly mention, uh, briefly, uh, mention that this similarity in their problem has um, uh, led to bringing them together in one form or another. The early, early understanding, it seems to me, if I go into the history, is the, the Dr. Bawasai Bambetkar, when he was in Colombia for three years, uh, he was influenced very much by the African-American movement. He was in Harlem, which is a place of hotbed of social uh, movement at that time. Uh, later, uh, I think uh, he was, he read Booker T. Washington, he watched the movement there. And in 1946, he had developed a communication with the boy. He wanted to submit the memorandum when the Human Rights Charter was passed by the UN. So there is a, there is an early beginning between the two. But later, I think many American scholars, uh, Oliver Fox uh, has a book on caste and class. Elena Zeliev, Owen Lynch, Gary Torpatow, to whom we have listened, Mark Gallanter, William Darity, and many others have studied the problem of Dalit and also African American in a comparative framework. So there has been an attempt to understand their problems and similarities. But most important is the, is the bridges that have been built up as far as the moment is concerned. Uh, you know, I would take only one example that uh, the Dalit Panther uh, was motivated by the Black Panther in USA. Uh, Kevin will share with us that experience. Uh, but the Dalit uh, movement also was influenced by by Dalit art, as you can see that it is Vijay uh, Tarpata has brought in uh, the Black literature. The African American, you know, feminist movement, they have influenced the Dalit movement uh, in India in the past. Of course, the policy has been influenced. I will end by saying one more point is that in the present time, the nature of the collaboration and understanding of caste and the African American problem has taken a new dimension now. Uh, the new dimension is that we have a sizable diaspora, Indian diaspora in USA and either other part of the country. Uh, we, you might have listened about the Equality Lab, the New Youth. Uh, you have Ambedkar International Mission, which was set up by um, uh, Dr. Kamle, who is from Nagpur. It was, it was taken over by now Nausar Mool and others. And they are extremely active in the uh, There is a Boston group uh, in Boston. And uh, there are groups from the Nepal. I won't be able to name, name the organization. Uh, but the more the issue has become a lot more volatile and visible with the incidence of caste discrimination in USA brought this all the group together. So we see a more activism. Uh, friends, this is what the background that I wanted to give you. And to share with us, uh, there are two important gentlemen, uh, Kevin uh, Brown and, and uh, Lawrence Hellman. I will tell about them, about their engagement that requires them to they share their views. You know, Professor Kevin Brown is a professor of law at Indiana University, Indiana. His research has been on law and racism, law and inequality. But most importantly, I'm just to cut on short, most importantly, his strength and his interest has been the comparative study of uh, African-American and Dalit, and also the South African and the other similar group in other countries of the world. Uh, I think the, uh, the comparative study has been his, his, his strength. He visited India three, four times uh, along with the group. I really do remember. In fact, uh, the lady whose book on past, uh, Isabella's book, Richardson, has become very famous. She was a part of his group. Uh, he has sent me a video uh, very nice. We can see that, uh, Isabella. Then uh, he participated in several conferences in India. And he's a friend of Dalit. Uh, so uh, uh, we have a we have a person who will share his experience of uh, Dalit and Black movement and their similarity and dissimilarity and their aspiration. But Professor Simon Lawrence uh, is at, at the moment is a, is a professor at Brandeis University, Waltham. Uh, this is near to Boston City. He's a director of a global development and sustainability uh, center. Uh, which is a part of the Heller School of Public Policy and Management. Both were established by him. Uh, he has served in a number of organizations, UNDP, World Bank, Oxfam, Google Foundation. Uh, 
uh, on the issues of poverty and marginalized groups. Uh, his current engagement is in social movement and uh, caste discrimination and on the issue of Dalit. Uh, his engagement on Dalit issue uh, began when he, when he in fact instituted certain financial support and fellowship for the Dalit the student to bring them in the Brandeis University. When he had come to my house and I met him and I was wondered by his interest. Then he set up a program of caste exclusion uh, as a part of that particular center under which he initiated annual conferences and it has become a very famous brand now that un unfinished legacy of Dr. Ambedkar of annihilation of caste. Uh, four or five conferences have been held so far. But most important outstanding outcome of his, his effort and activity is the starting of a journal on caste exclusion by the Brandeis University, which is popularly called as called as J Cast. Uh, it is it is the it is his initiative and the initiative of the Brandeis University that the first journal in the world uh, has been set up and it will be a platform where people from all over the world will write on the issue of caste. There are prices and costs to be paid to take the issue of uh, uh, Dalit in USA. I won't discuss that. Uh, but his, one of the remarkable achievements was that uh, he included the caste in the code of discrimination of Brandeis University. That uh, while they don't tolerate the discrimination associated with race, gender, ethnicity, religion, they also added the caste. Uh, and that's, that's the only university in USA uh, that, uh, uh, that, that has included this freedom. Well, I must tell you with, uh, with you that uh, Jerry uh, Simon, uh, Lawrence Simon has a very uh, prestigious history. He is the founder of the World Jews Organization. But in the Brandeis, I think uh, uh, he has brought new dimension. I will only end by saying that, uh, telling you the background of the Brandeis city that, you know, Jews face discrimination in getting admission in the Harvard University. They used to talk in the list. And the other kids quite come uncomfortable. So there was a discrimination quota was fixed for them, even if they were uh, qualified. And finally, you know, the some of the prominent Jews and others decided to set up a university, what is called Brandeis University. And I must share with you that Albert Einstein was also one of the founding members. Uh, the Brandeis uh, is, is the name of the first Jew uh, judge of the uh, Supreme Court of USA very eminent person. So the university stands for pluralism, liberalism, and in the interest of the minority. I think this is uh, what we have both uh, Kevin Brown and uh, Lawrence Simon. Uh, with this brief introduction, I will now uh, go to Kevin Brown to share with us for another 30, 35 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, well, well, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Professor Thurat. And and certainly, as you indicated, um, I've been to India actually closer to 17 times. Um, a couple of those visits were bringing a group of academics and 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 to share and have conversations and conferences, comparing the struggles of African Americans with Dalits and. We had an opportunity to, to meet with the scholars at the Indian Institute for Dalit Studies that, that Professor Thurat uh, set up for us. Um, um, and, and I've also um, been very active in terms of participating in, in celebrations of Dr. and Becker. So I've spoken at birthday celebrations for him at Columbia, uh, London, uh, Mumbai, New Delhi, uh, Wanasi, for a number of places, and and he and I were were, were joking about this. Uh, but if you actually change, if you actually adjust for the time between India and the United States, the day I was born was 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 October fourteenth, nineteen fifty six. Um, so I've always sort of thought that my connection to the dollar struggle was. Um, preordained, so to speak. Um, well, I, what what I want to talk about, I, I've done a lot of real work, so I, I want to pull up on the current book project I'm working on, which is really directed towards trying to create a better sound basis for further cooperation between African-Americans on this side 
and, and ballots on that side. Um, and, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So I'll be talking about that project. So in the minds of, of many African Americans, when we think of oppression on the Indian subcontinent, we think of Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi's connection to Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. nonviolence also makes him an integral part of the black civil rights struggle. So in order for Dalits and African Americans to form closer relationships, it really is necessary to address the high regard that the black community has for the upper caste Hindu leader, Mahatma Gandhi. And what I'll try to do in my talk is to provide a basis for African Americans and Dalits to move forward by re-examining the relationship that Gandhi had with the African American community. So if you think of us as African Americans, um, when we walked off the first slave ship in 1619 uh, into Jamestown, Virginia, we have faced oppression. But against this background of 400 years of racial domination, we formulated a counter discourse that is an alternative way of understanding our condition, where we rejected the notion that there was something wrong with us as Black people, and instead realized that our degraded position was a result of oppression, not, uh, not inferiority. So, so that's the central feature in the African-American counter discourse and really in what I would call African-American culture itself was, is, and perhaps always will be the resistance of black people to our racial subordination and the liberation of black people uh, from racial oppression. Now, the African-American counter discourse has always contained an international tradition. And once our international tradition shifted from an analogy to Blacks in Africa to another place in the world, it shifted to the Indian subcontinent. Um, so drawing analogies between the oppression of Blacks in the US and oppression on the Indian subcontinent does not start with King borrowing from Gandhi. It actually starts with abolitionists in the 1830s who were comparing the African-American oppression to oppression on the Indian subcontinent generated by the caste system. So abolitionists like Frederick Douglass and Robert Morris and, and William Lloyd Garrison and Carl Sumner uh, use this comparison analogy to critique not only slavery in the South, but the discriminatory treatment that Blacks experienced in the North, uh, which were a product of, of racist attitudes. So throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century, it was the caste analogy that remained central to the arguments that the treatment of Blacks in the U.S., was illogical, immoral, unchristian-like, and unjust. I indeed, the significant examples of African Americans fighting against their racial uh, op oppression involved the caste analogy. So, for example, in 1849, Blacks sought to desegregate the public schools in Boston, Massachusetts, and the attorneys there drew on the caste analogy to argue that segregation was wrong. Um, many of the proponents for the passage of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and this is the amendment that will grant Jewish, black citizenship social reformer, and will and also politician. mandate As a uh, equal protection of the law of due process jurist, and his deny states the ability to deprive like U.S. citizens and of their privileges and immunity. Uh, that amendment was added to the U.S. Constitution in 1868, and its proponents argued that the purpose of that amendment was to eradicate the functioning of caste on U.S. soil. Indeed, Black activists used the caste-based analogy in their legal arguments in the infamous 
1896 Supreme Court case of Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson is one where our U.S. Supreme Court, in an eight to one opinion, will uphold the doctrine of separate but equal. Um, and that will also further Jim Crow legislation. But there was one justice who dissented from that decision. And that justice wrote what probably is considered the most famous legal decision by a justice in the history of the United States, Justice Harlan. And Justice Harlan, who objected to segregation and separate but equal, but you know, as I said, was in dissent, wrote in his opinion, in the view of the US Constitution, in the eye of the law here, there is no country, no superior, no dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Uh, indeed, if we think about the most powerful and impactful civil rights organization in US history, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, when the NAACP adopted its original charter in 1911, it also employed the caste-based analogy. So while the caste-based analogy has continued in importance for the black struggle to the present day, at the end of the 19th century, uh, blacks began to increasingly focus on international events. And partially this was spurred on by the scramble for Africa that comes after the Berlin Conference in the 1880s and the Spanish-American War, where the United States takes control of a number of colonies, including the Philippines, uh, Cuba, and, and Puerto Rico. Uh, African-Americans then started to increasingly stress an international perspective that viewed world affairs is mediated by the importance of the role of race and racism. So as a result, African-Americans came to increasingly view their struggle against white supremacy in the form of segregation in the United States as a local part of a global struggle of people of color against white supremacy. And the, particip the precipitating event for this beginning of the change in perspective for the African-American community occurs in 1905 with the military defeat of Russia by Japan. Uh, while the decisive battle in the Russian-Japanese War of 1905 was a sea battle, at the time, Russia had the largest army in the world. So in, in that victory, what we see for the first time is a nation of people of color taking up arms against a white society and winning a military battle. Indeed, let me read you what W.E.B. Du Bois, the legendary black intellectual who's going to play a significant role throughout my conversation here. Let me tell you what he said about the victory of Japan uh, in 1905. Du Bois wrote, for the first time in a thousand years, a great white nation has measured arms with a colored nation and been found wanting. The Russo-Japanese War has marked an epic. The magic of the world white is already broken and the color line in civilization has been crossed in modern times as it was in the great past. The awakening of the yellow races is certain that the awakening of the brown and black races will follow in time, no unprejudiced student of history can doubt. Shall the awakening of these sleepy millions be in accordance with and aided by the great ideals of white civilization or in spite of them and against them? This is the problem of the color line. And you see within the black community in 1905, not only is Japan held up, for this military victory by Du Bois, but also by Booker T. Washington, um, um, by Marcus Garvey, by all of the significant black leaders of the time. So it's in this environment where blacks are now thinking about their 
condition in global terms is a global struggle against white supremacy, that we become increasingly aware of the efforts of Indian freedom fighters. And indeed, two freedom or one freedom fighter in particular should be mentioned, um, and, and that would be Lodgepot Rye who spins from 1914 to 1919 in the US, but Rye makes a particular point of coming to understand the black American struggle. And he meets with black leaders throughout the country, talking about the Indian freedom struggle and talking about um, the connection to the African American struggle. Indeed, He actually dedicate his 1928 book, Indian Princess, to Rye. Um, so for Black leaders, including Du Bois, including Marcus Garvey, they begin to analogize the African-American struggle against white supremacy in the form of segregation to the struggle of the Indian independence movement against white supremacy in the form of British colonialism. Thus, even before Gandhi comes onto the scene, uh, African-American leaders are aware of the Indian freedom struggle. Uh, now, conditioned by their prior use of the caste analogy, as renowned black historian Gerald Horn will put it, the question of untouchables was the hallmark of the relations between Black America and India. Nevertheless, Dr. and Becker is rarely mentioned by the Black press. Most of the African-American leaders supporting the Indian freedom fighters believed that what the Indian freedom fighters were fighting for was a dual victory. One, overcoming white supremacy and British colonialism, and two, eradicating the curse of untouchability. For African-Americans then, this dual victory made the cause of Indian independence an incredibly noble one. Because by supporting Indian independence, African-Americans believed they were not only backing a fight against white supremacy, they were backing a struggle to overcome one of the worst forms of oppression of humankind in untouchability. However, uh, no one has done more, obviously, to liberate Dalits uh, than Dr. Mbetker, but as I indicated, he was rarely mentioned. For the Black media, Gandhi became the focal point of the dual victory. The Black press often pointed to Gandhi's treatment of Dalits. Indeed, by the time we get to the 1930s, the Black press was comparing Gandhi to Buddha, Muhammad, and Jesus Christ, and lauding his moral leadership in world affairs. Uh, this actually became commonplace. So for example, William Pickens, who was a founding member of the Niagara Movement, which would later be absorbed by the NAACP, and a field secretary of the NAACP, wrote in an article in September 1931 of the New, New of the Black New York Amsterdam News that was so complimentary of Gandhi, he included Gandhi was the greatest man of the world in the age. Indeed, in his syndicated column on October 28, 1931, Du Bois praised Gandhi's conduct during the second roundtable discussion. But with, when we talk about misunderstandings between the Dalek community and the African-American community, no question the events surrounding the Pune Pact play a central role. Um, as you know, Gandhi and the Congress Party were invited to the first roundtable discussion and they boycotted. But Mbetker attended and ably represented the Dalits. Needless to say, without G Gandhi, however, um, and the Congress party, there could be no true agreement obtained at, at the first roundtable discussion. And at the second roundtable discussion, 
Gandhi and Ann Becker clashed over who truly represented the Dalits. But once again, like the first roundtable discussion, there was no agreement that was found there. The African-American community, however, was largely unaware of the dispute between Ann Becker and Gandhi over who was the true leader of the Dalits. Now, in light of the failure of the second roundtable discussion to reach an agreement, on August 16, 1932, the British Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald announced a plan for providing India with more self-government that included, included communal wards uh, for Dalits, Indian Christians, Anglo-Indians, Europeans, as well as Muslims and Sikhs. And, and I don't have to go into this with an Indian audience because you understand the nature of communal wards. Um, and you know, Gandhi objected bitterly to the communal wards for Dalits, but no other group. So in September 18, 1932, Gandhi will announce his hunger strike unto death. And by the end of September, and Becker will be compelled to reach an agreement with Gandhi because of the tremendous pressure being placed on, on Ambedkar, um, especially physical threats uh, by caste Hindus against, against Dalits if, in fact, Gandhi were to die. Um, now, here's the point. A sharp contrast exists between the views of Dalit activists about the events that led up to the Pune Pact compared to how it was portrayed by the black media. The black media saw Gandhi in a self-sacrificing role. Indeed, the Washington Tribune, black owned Washington Tribune would write, the dramatic fast unto death undertaken by Gandhi on behalf of India's forgotten men the 60 million untouchables came to an end Monday evening with the British and Indian governments approving a settlement. Wendell Dabney, editor of the Cincinnati Union, would write, the starving Gandhi shows the world the greatness, the grandeur, the sincerity of his soul. He shows it in all pristine purity, a humanitarian that has not flowered since Jesus Christ. And in an article in November 1932 issue of The Crisis, and The Crisis is the magazine of the NAACP that was controlled by Du Bois. And Du Bois would state, the purpose of Gandhi's fast was to force his majesty's government to reach an agreement with all Hindus of all castes that would lead to the termination of control by the British and would not strengthen caste barriers in India. However, um, oh, perhaps even more damning though, was the issue was in the same crisis issue, Gandhi also talks about Ambedkar. Indeed, to this point, it's the only time I've seen Ambedkar's name mentioned in the crisis. Um, but here's what Du Bois writes about and Becker, and he's writing about, he, remember, he writes this in the context of the earlier article that talks about Gandhi's purpose and his fast unto death. And he writes about and Becker at the first roundtable conference. And Du Bois writes, this is quoting Du Bois, that was a splendid speech by Mr. M. Becker. He said that when the British came to India 150 years ago, we were in a loathsome condition. We could not draw water at the village wells. We could not enter a temple. We could not serve on the police force. We could not serve in the army. And what happened? He said nothing. We are just as badly off now as we were before the English came. And you see, this, this selection of Du Bois makes several key points about how the African-American community and most black leaders understood Gandhi and the independence struggle. Number one, Du Bois makes the point that the independence struggle for India is furthered by uniting the different Indian factions who wanted independence from British rule. Second, that the British were no friends of the Dalits after all, 
And Becker himself had stated that their condition did not improve under 150 years of British rule. And third, British imperialists sought only to use the dollars to divide the Indian people into a number of factions uh, that were in conflict with each other in order to weaken the Indian independence movement. Whereas in contrast, um, right, I guess I don't really need to say this, but I'm, I'm going to say it anyway. Um, Gandhi's fast until death was viewed as the ultimate exercise of power by caste Hindus to crush the hopes of Dalit dreams by Dalit activists. So Dalit activists saw Gandhi as far more concerned with preserving high caste Hindu hegemony than Dalit equality. And for rather obvious reasons, right? Gandhi, the way Dalits understood this was that Gandhi was effectively saying, I will die to prevent you from obtaining effective political representation. Add this to the fact that Gandhi believed untouchability should be abolished, but was also against caste. Thus, Dalits would simply become low caste Hindus. And Gandhi also believed that all, including Dalits, should follow their ancestral occupations. And finally, Gandhi's position on untouchability meant that he believed that caste Hindus would somehow see Dalits in a different light, even though they were continuing to occupy the same positions that they had before. Um, however, within the Black community coming from the events of the Pune past, Gandhi's saintly reputation in the African-American community was solidified. So much so that during 1936, when Ambedkar is writing Annihilation of Caste and Gandhi is responding to it, several prominent African-American leaders go to India to interact with Gandhi. And these were no ordinary black leaders. One was Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman um, at the time was the professor of religion at Howard University. And Howard University is still seen today as the most prestigious black university in the country. But he would then become professor of religion and philosophy at Morehouse and Spelman College. And those two would be seen as the second and third most powerful black higher education or college institutions in the country. So Howard Thurman is someone who is the professor of religion and philosophy to the elite blacks being educated at, at the best colleges and universities for blacks in the country. Thurman would be called a teacher of teachers, a preacher of preachers, an activator of activists, and a mover of movers. He was the spiritual guide to legendary civil rights leaders, including James Farmer, Mary Wright Edelman, Baynard Rustin, Jesse Jackson, all of whom will make play major roles in the black civil rights struggle of the 1960s and 1970s. His wife, Sue Bailey, would become influential in her own right as the first editor of the National Council of Negro Women's Afro-American Women's Journal. And the National Council of Negro Women is still considered the most powerful Negro or Black female organization in the country's history. Channing Tobias will also visit Gandhi during 1936. Tobias will, come on, will go on to become chairman of the NAACP. He will be appointed by President Harry Truman to the first presidential committee on civil rights ever created. And, and lastly was Benjamin Mays. Um, at the time, Benjamin Mays was dean of the School of Religion at Howard University, but he would go on to become the longtime president at Morehouse College, being president there from 1940 to 1967, during the time, of course, that Martin Luther King Jr. will attend Morehouse College. And Mays taught many influential African-American activists, including jo Julian Bond and Maynard Jackson. 
Indeed, Benjamin Mays will give the eulogy at Dr. King's funeral. So with these visits from these very high powerful African-Americans, Gandhi's nonviolent techniques now find their ways into the leading black educational institutions of the time. And African-American leaders continue to support the Indian independence struggle and will do so all the way up through World War II um, and indeed even into independence. And of course, with independence, in 1947, India will also adopt a constitution where, which was the drafting committee was chaired by Dr. Ambedkar. So there's several provisions in that constitution that attack untouchability and provide reservations in higher education, governmental jobs, and political reservations. Um, so we're now, however, some 70 years removed from India's independence and its adoption of a constitution that sought to abolish untouchability. For African-Americans, we are now 65 years removed from the U.S. Supreme Court opinion in Brown versus Board of Education uh, in 1954, which was the critical decision for us that launches us into the civil rights movement. This passage of time now allows both the African-American community and the Dalit community, but the African-American community in particular, to reassess its relationship to the oppression on the Indian subcontinent. And, and in that reassessment to begin with, it's obvious that while India did obtain independence, it did not eliminate op oppression that Dalits encountered due to untouchability. Thus, the dual victory upon which African-Americans built their relationship with the Indian independence struggle did not. Kevin Brown, another five minutes, four to five oh, minutes. Yeah, yeah, I'm just about done. Um, now, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. An independent India engaged in a fight against white supremacy in ways it was during the British Raj. Um, as a result, the basis of the connection between the African American community and India that was forged in the last, in the first three decades of the 20th century, no longer exists. And no event dramatizes that more to African Americans than the unbelievable reception that President Donald Trump received on his visit to India in front of a stadium with 125,000 people in attendance. So now is an appropriate time for the African-American community to revisit its historical embrace of the caste-based analogy and use it as a basis to foster closer ties to the Dalit community because after all, that is, with that analogy, it is the Dalits who are our natural allies. So I would like to close by citing an old African proverb, until the lion has his historians, tales of the hunt shall always glorify the hunter. That's it. Thank you very much, Kevin Brown. I think uh, you have really brought in uh, light on some of the areas which were really unknown to us. And, uh, we will have a discussion at the end, if time permits. Um, uh, a very important period, and your thrown light. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have a discussion on this. But to save the time, I will now uh, request uh, Lauren Simon to uh, share his thought on this occasion. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Professor Porat. And um, uh, it's certainly a pleasure to also share this webinar with uh, Professor Brown. Um, like uh, Professor Brown, my, my first visit to India was in the mid-1980s, actually, after I founded the American Jewish World Service. And among our first funding was to support Dalit organizations in India. Perhaps the reasons will become clearer in a few moments. The common thread is that, of course, of social discrimination. So that thread will tie us together with the Dalit struggle, and the African-American struggle too. So let me begin there. 
Social discriminations usually have long histories rooted in oppression. The, nature, the nationwide protests we see on America's streets were sparked by, of course, the murder of George Floyd. But all oppressions and marginalizations have long histories. Mr. Floyd's oppression began a little over 400 years ago, in 1619, with the first slave ship arriving in the English colony of Virginia, and thus began 250 years of slavery. At the end of the Civil War, which was fought to end slavery, there was a short period of reconstruction <clears throat> where freed slaves made significant progress during essentially a union occupation of former slave states in the South. But then the white population of the Southern states succeeded in taking back control and passed laws called the Jim Crow laws, crippling the promise of democracy for freed slaves. The legacy of slavery is still palpable in the poverty and oppression of blacks in America. Despite the economic progress that blacks have made in the past decades, with many entering the middle class, some factors still perpetuate oppression. I can't breathe has become the rallying cry, not only to end police brutality, but to end racism that is embedded in the bias known as white privilege. Certainly that's not to say that all people of European ancestry are racist, but all peoples of any ethnicity or culture see through their own lenses, have certain biases that, are, that many are not even aware of, and biases reinforced in our houses of worship, in the, history, in the way history is taught in our schools, um, in our national and religious holidays, in who we build statues to, and who we marry, and for some, who we hang, who we hang out with uh, even at the local pub. The equivalent of white privilege is found in the very roots of caste. The English word caste derives from the Latin castus, denoting being cut off or separated. And the Portuguese casta carried that further into the concept of purity of lineage, race, or breed, thus separating the colonial Portuguese from the indigenous and mixed races of their colony in Brazil. The concept of purity can poison cultures and create pseudo-speciation, a term first used by the American psychologist, Eric Erickson, to describe marginalized groups considered so inferior that they have become in the eyes of the oppressor distinct and subhuman species. We, have, we only have to think of the Europeans' attitude toward the Native Americans, or the exploitation of the African slave, or blacks in apartheid states of Africa, or the Jews of Imperial Russia, my own ancestors, who were confined to the pale of settlement, limited to Jewish quarters for education, and suffering for centuries the collective raids, which were called pogroms, on peaceful Jewish towns in the Russias. Sadly, Western history is littered with such dehumanization, and their legacies are still palpable in contemporary societies. <coughs> Asia was the cradle of some of the world's major faiths, and yet today, in the name of those religions, pogroms are led against religious minorities in Sri Lanka and Myanmar, and yes, of course, in India. This tragedy <coughs> of moral and spiritual corruption has sustained the oldest form of prejudice in the world today the division of society into rigid, earth-based graded hierarchy of caste. While progress towards social equality has been made, the birth-based caste system has survived millennia and continues to hinder the lives of millions of low caste and Dalit and tribal citizens. It remains a leading cause of horrendous acts of violence, including gang rape and lynching and honor killings for inter-caste romances, it results in suicides on Indian campuses, bias in employment and housing, and a staggering waste of human potential. Despite reformist movements and affirmative action policies, and even after constitutional legal protections, the stigma of untouchability still exists in a culture derived from ancient history. So how then do we counter the dominance of these deeply embedded beliefs? these mythologies of superiority. 
We need to do so, of course, within each of our societies and build coalitions with other communities of marginalization around the world. In this, I applaud the work, for instance, of Paul Divacar, who helps to build networks and global partnerships and joint actions in addressing discrimination based on work, descent, and caste. We need to convene international meetings on marginalization, such as, as Professor Thorat uh, mentioned in the introduction, the now five international conferences begun at Brandeis on the unfinished legacy of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. And we need national governments to raise these issues in bilateral and multilateral settings. But we need strategic interventions in key institutions within our own societies. So let me address, at least superficially given our time today, three domains of influence. The first is in higher education, where, of course, my professional life is, is based. I will speak about the US, and you can fill in the experience, of course, of India or other countries. As many of you know, Professor Thorat and I founded an academic journal called CAST, a global journal on social exclusion. This came about in part when I noticed that many South Asian studies programs at US universities did not have courses that highlighted caste, even in syllabi on religions of India, courses on political histories or on South Asian cultures. Our journal has an editorial advisory board and I'm honored that Professor Kevin Brown is on it, along with 29 other leading scholars from 10 nations, including such luminaries as the former chief economist of the World Bank and leading sociologists and philosophers. One such member is the renowned philosopher Martha Nussbaum, who once wrote about her own experience many years ago, studying the classics and literature at Harvard. She wrote that women were not represented in the canon, in the curriculum that she studied, and that a young woman studying literature could come to believe that if women were absent in the curriculum, women don't count. I would say that if Dalits are absent, in the syllabi, they don't count. It is not even an oversight. It is a willful editing of history, a justification for one's own privilege. In truth, however, they are silenced and high caste privilege is ever as powerful and destructive as white privilege or white supremacy. So building a network across America of engaged scholars of caste is one of the objectives of our journal. Our journal, by the way, has an annual competition for emerging scholars on issues of caste. And I hope that you will go to our website for details. It is called the Bluestone Rising Scholar Prize. Another way we have raised the issue of caste in, higher, in American higher education was right on our campus at Brandeis University as Professor made reference to. Brandeis was the ideal starting point for us because it was founded in 1948 as a model of ethnic and religious pluralism. Though we are a non-sectarian university, our founders were prominent Jews, including people like Albert Einstein, and non-Jews like Eleanor Roosevelt, who disliked the quota system at the Ivy League schools at the time that admitted Jews or anyone not white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant only in small numbers by welcoming students, faculty, and staff of every nationality, religion, or orientation, Brandeis rose to national prominence and contributed to the demise of the quota system of the Ivy League. In 1985, Brandeis was elected to the Association of American Universities, an invitation-only group of the 63 leading research universities in the US and Canada. Like all other universities, our non-discrimination policies incorporated legally protected categories of race and gender and so on. But caste is not a protected category under any state or federal law in the United States. Therefore, I raised the issue of caste on campus and the administration formed a task force, which I co-chaired with our vice president for diversity, equity and inclusion. Our task was to tactfully and confidentially survey our university community to determine if caste identities led to any experience of discrimination. In short, we did not find any allegations of discrimination by the administration or by faculty, even faculty, even those of Indian descent. 
but we received significant testimony of caste discrimination amongst students from South Asia. This was felt by low caste and Dalit students. Our inquiry lasted almost a year and resulted in the university including caste in our non-discrimination policies. We believe we're the first in the United States to do so. You know, universities are enormously influential in much of the world in their teachings through their curricula, as well as in their campus policies, expand or constrain the reasoning and reflections of future generations. You know, the US had over a million foreign students at our universities last year. They should take that message about caste home to all corners of the world. So secondly, let me comment briefly on faith communities. World religions have played an important role historically in both oppression and liberation. The Peruvian Roman Catholic theologian, Father Gustavo Gutierrez, who is often called the father of liberation theology, says, and I, I'm quoting here from Father Gutierrez, he says, the denunciation of injustice implies the rejection of the use of Christianity to legitimize the established order. So we on this program today might ask if the denunciation of injustice in India and in Nepal or elsewhere implies the rejection of the use of any, any faith to legitimize the established order. Let me be clear, this is not an anti-Hindu argument, but a plea that outdated, antiquated, and harmful social structures need to be jettisoned for the faith to thrive and enrich the lives of the faithful. Right now, there are some fundamental fundamentalist Jews, people of my own faith, who advocate in Israel that since God led us to the promised land, which today needs to reclaim all the territory of biblical Israel, there are many Jews who say, no, we need to recognize the rights of other people, the Palestinians in this case, who like Jews, or even a Semitic people, all sons of Abraham, and live in peace and share prosperity and brotherhood. And again, Father Gutierrez commenting on the endemic poverty of Latin America, a poverty sustained by historic oppression on that continent, says, and again, I quote from Father Gutierrez, but the poor person does not exist as an inescapable fact of destiny, his or her existence is not politically neutral and it is not ethically innocent. The poor, he says, are a byproduct of the system in which we live and for which we are responsible. They are marginalized by our social and cultural world. They are the oppressed, exploited proletariat, robbed of the fruit of their labor and despoiled of their humanity. Hence the poverty of the poor is not a call to generous relief action, he goes on to say but a demand that we go and build a different social order. And I would comment that I am sure Father Gutierrez would apply that same reasoning to those oppressed by caste and who labor in the sewers and those children still in some schools who sit segregated from others. Many religious institutions have gone through reformations. The Dutch Reformed Church of South Africa the major church of the Africana people, taught for many years the biblical justification of racial apartheid. As the anti-apartheid movement gained strength, it prompted their religious leaders to look inward, to search their souls and their understanding of their God. And they issued a deeply reflective apology and embraced the liberation of all South Africans. We might ask in this webinar whether that can happen in India or other nations. Thousands of years of oppression of a birth-based social hierarchy has so deeply embedded itself in Indian culture that it has today bred a social movement of Dalit assertion that insists not only on their constitutional rights, but on the radical transformation of human relationships toward a new ethical culture of equality, not only in law, but in everyday life. That's the great struggle unfolding in India, and I believe Nepal, and indeed in other cultures throughout the world. My own mentor in my early career, the Brazilian Paulo Freire, 
saw the vocation of humanization of everyday life as epoch changing. For Ambedkar, it was an act of conversion to Buddhism, an act that said that if the religion of his childhood does not permit a path to liberation for his people, then he would seek his own path. Of course, this was heresy to some, but it was an act of liberation to others. In other words, freedom means the power of critical consciousness to reject a state of mind that one grows up with. We need to be careful, for Hinduism is one of the great world religions in rich in meaning. Like other world religions, its future relevance for younger generations may depend on the possibility of rejecting the very notion of caste, not just softening the sharp edge of discrimination, but rejecting outright the inferiority of any child born into its traditions. And so briefly, the third domain of influence that I wish to touch upon is the domain of corporate culture. So recently of California, which has sued Cisco Systems, Inc., one of America's most important high-tech firms, and two of its employees on behalf of an Indian engineer of Dalit background, who alleges that because of caste prejudice, he was paid less, given fewer opportunities and inferior workplace conditions. Bloomberg Law, an online newspaper, reports that California alleges, and I quote from the article, that his superiors and co-workers were beneficiaries of the caste system and therefore imported this form of bias to Cisco and the, and the US at large. If successful, the case will be an important precedent that helps to establish caste as a distinct form of discrimination in the United States and one that is not adequately captured by the current protected categories under state and federal law. So in summary, there is a great struggle unfolding in South Asia and indeed other cultures throughout the world, including America. My mentor again, Paolo Freire, once wrote in a book called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. He said, the oppressors who oppress, exploit and rape by virtue of their power cannot find in this power the strength to liberate either the oppressed or themselves. Only power that springs from the weakness of the oppressed would be sufficiently strong to free both. I always found that a curious expression. Only power that springs from the weakness of the oppressed will be sufficiently strong to, to free both. The think he meant that power that springs from weakness can be self-reflective and learn to question the fixed reality that envelops all of us. And no matter how wrenching it is, to enter a world of possibility that finally disperses the social illusion that has dulled our minds. One of George Floyd's young children, through the misery of their loss, said, Daddy changed the world. I'd like now to talk more con concretely for just a few moments about George Floyd's world, or perhaps the world of all George Floyd's. And I will share, I'd like to share my screen uh, to do so. Just give me a moment, please. Okay, I hope, can you see this screen? Uh, uh, Kevin, can you see the screen? No? Not right now. Oh, yeah, okay. Not right now. okay, thank you very much. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go through a few slides that perhaps help to, help to describe the, the world of George Floyd's, and I use Floyd's in the plural. This is this is uh, this is data from uh, income varies uh, widely across racial and ethnic groups in the United States. This is uh, data from the United States Census Bureau Counter Population Survey, and it, and we can just see in a in a in, in a quick glance here that Asian Americans actually have the highest um, household income in the United States, followed uh, closely by white non-Hispanic families, and then far below are Hispanic of any race, and then we see the black population of America, black households with the very lowest um, um, uh, income, uh, 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 income uh, 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 data. Here is a similar way to present it in the mean net growth and median net growth, and again, divided between white, black, Hispanic, and, and other. 
But this is an important slide for, for us, I think, because this is the city of Chicago. This data was, uh, was uh, um, uh, put together by New York University, uh, by one of their medical institutes. And this data is pre-pandemic, okay? Um, each of these little uh, squares that you see there are, are uh, census um, uh, tracts and, um, and divide the, um, the city of Chicago according to these uh, local neighborhoods. The, the, the lightest pink squares are those that have the highest life expectancy at birth. As you get to the darker pinks and reds, you get to the lowest life expectancy in those neighborhoods by birth, okay? And what is most stunning about this data, and again, this is pre-pandemic data, is that the African-American communities and communities of color are generally segregated, not, not de jure segregation, of course, this is, um, this is de facto segregation, are largely in the, low, in the uh, deepest pink and red districts, okay? And the lightest pinks are the uh, lighter skin peoples and white uh, population. And the stunning thing about this is that the difference in life expectancy at birth from, uh, from, the, uh, from the red districts, which are mostly African-American, to the white districts or the light, the light pink or white uh, 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 squares there is 30 years. 30 years life expectancy difference between the poor, what are probably the poorest Chicago population and the wealthiest population. Nationwide, black people are dying during the COVID-19 at two and a half times the rate of white people. And we'd have to have a whole webinar probably to discuss the reasons of pre-existing conditions of environmental pollution in neighborhoods, right? Of lack of, at lack of adequate uh, uh, and competent medic, uh, access to healthcare. And we could go on with other, uh, other reasons why this, this takes place. And then this is also a stunning statistic, which I think we need to, um, uh, I need to present, um, uh, and these are the last two slides. Um, this, is, this data is from the United States Federal Reserve. The US Federal Reserve is the central bank of America, okay? And they do every, every um, uh, periodically, they do a survey of household income in the United States. This, this data is from their last update, January 27, 2020. 39% of adults, now this is not divided racially, but it, because there are a lot of poor blacks in America also, but I think it shows us something about the segregation in our society and the ongoing oppression in our society that, is, that results in the poverty that we see in America, of including all races while weighted, of course, toward the people of color. 39% of adults could not cover a $400 emergency without borrowing, selling, or, or uh, selling something or without deferring their rent, food, or health care. That's astounding in the, what is the richest country in the world. 39% of adults could not cover a $400 emergency. Now, $400 in America, believe me, is a, is a very small sum of money to have in a bank. One fourth of adults, the US Federal Reserve says, skipped necessary medical care in 2018 because they were, un, they were unable to afford the cost. Astounding in the richest country in the world. And then finally, and I close here, one in three Americans, according to a survey by the Pew Charitable Trusts, which is a major and very well-respected foundation in the United States, one in three American families have no savings at all. Now we know, of course, that it would be uh, it would be most important for us to be able to see the distribution of this uh, according to uh, according to race. Um, but the the um, the thread that is carried through social discrimination threads through all races in America, and also, of course, it threads through low caste, tribal, um, and Dalit people in India. I think this is, this is, however the manifestations may be different in each of our cultures and countries, there is a strong commonality between race and caste, and I would say between poverty, race, and caste. Thank you, Professor Thorat. I'm sorry, we can't hear you, Professor Thorat. Uh, 
Well, let me thank uh, both of you uh, for making a very important point, new point rather. Uh, and I, I believe that the participants in this webinar have benefited quite a lot. We have, uh, I, I have asked the organizer, we have about 10 to uh, 15 minutes where I would like to uh, have a discussion between us on important points. I would not like to summarize the whole discussion. But let me uh, put up a question to Kevin Brown. Uh, I think this has been, uh, it has been my, it has been a sort of a riddle to me as to why there has not been cooperation between the African American or Black and the Dalit in the early period of 60s and 70s and 80s uh, and even earlier, uh, 40s. Now I get the uh, clue from your presentation that the, the, the Black newspaper as well as NWCP, the main organization of the African American, which was set up in 1925, uh, had a different viewpoint. Uh, they, they, they had a much more sympathetic view towards Gandhi, and they, they, they didn't really appreciate the position of Dr. Ambedkar as much as they should have. And that must have, that might have discouraged many of the African Americans to build a bridge and interrelation with the Dalit movement. Uh, I just want to ask you, the ultimate climax of this uh, less connection was Martin Luther King came to India and he visited a couple of people, uh, but he never visited the uh, the institution built up by Dr. Ambedkar or he never discussed with the leader of Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, how do you reflect on this? And, uh, uh, and, uh, and now I can see that there is a, there is yeah. a reversal of that, but it took a lot of time. And even today, even today, there is not at the African American uh, movement level, there is the connection is not very, very strong. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, there's Could absolutely no question. That's sort of the central point uh, of my entire focus is to build those connections. So having worked so much on build, building those connections, it is Gandhi and the African American understanding of Gandhi that really gets in the way. Um, so if you think about the African-American community, you've got to at least go to 1865. Up until that time, over 90 percent of us were, were held in, in, in slavery. And for the other 10 percent, they were just barely eking out existence. Um, we don't really start to get in a point where we can think globally to the beginning of the 20th century. But what, what really then happens is this this victory of Japan because that created a new idea and the new idea was maybe one day all the colored people of the world could come together in a massive alliance against white supremacy and that was the idea that the black community really ran with now because we always had this analogy of our treatment to the Indian caste system. There's already an understanding throughout all of the African-American community. We are victims of caste discrimination too. It's just that we never really connected that up to a detailed examination of the caste system to go, okay, here are Dalits, here are low caste Hindus, uh, here are upper caste Hindus. So, so the what I'm saying is the architecture of the structure of us coming together is already there. We're just trying to activate that structure. We're trying to say, come on, Black people, you've been saying we're victims of caste discrimination for hundreds of years. Doesn't that make sense that our natural allies would be Dalits? Um, and, and and I want to go back, though, though, though I want to go back there because I do think you got to understand the way the African American community understood God um, and the Indian freedom fighters. And remember, the first Indian freedom fighter that we really get extensive exposure to is Lodgepot Rye. And Lodgepot Rye also makes a point of saying um, untouchability is abhorrent. I, I disagree with it. It needs to be abolished. Um, so the Indian freedom fighters that we deal with are people who are also saying, 
We want to abolish untouchability. We recognize that this is a real problem. We want to abolish it. So when Gandhi comes along and Gandhi is saying the same thing, what you have from the standpoint of the African-American community is we can join the Indian freedom struggle and fight racism, white racism, as well as untouchability. And, and it therefore made the Indian freedom fighters struggle from the eyes of the African Americans, probably the most noble struggle one could engage in. Uh, that's why I think what we're trying to do now is say, okay, yes, the Indian freedom fighters did some positive things, but just like us, when segregation was ended, we all came to discover that wasn't enough. And, and now we and now being able to put distance between your independence and, and your constitution in the 1940s and our Brown versus Board of Education in the 1950s, we can say, yes, obviously their success or their lack of success is the same as ours. Let us go back to that cast analogy. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, it's so nice of you. Uh, I would like to go back to uh, uh, Lawrence Simon. Uh, you have uh, you have really ref referred to the the effort by Brandeis University to include uh, the caste discrimination in the general provision against discrimination. Uh, and uh, Brandeis University is the first university which has taken this initiative. But at the same time, I understand that uh, the there has been a reaction, a negative reaction by the Hindu organization for bringing caste discrimination on the agenda. Uh, one of the important features of Hindu organization in USA, or for that matter in UK, is that uh, unlike the Christian religious authority, they have not accepted and that, that Hinduism has done something wrong to the Antichrist. Uh, they don't still feel that uh, they should side with the Untouchables, uh, the league against untouchability and caste. I give you an example of UK that when uh, complaints were made of caste discrimination in UK, the UK government set up a committee under the Equality Commission, and David Moss and uh, another professor from university, and they submitted the report and they find out a lot of discrimination in UK of the Dalit by the Hindu high caste. And the British government brought to be. And then what happened? Then the international Hindu organization, including the priest organization in UK, put a lot of pressure on Brown then Prime Minister, and in fact, they did an arm to stick that we won't vote you. As a result, the bill was put into uh, uh, into box, and it is still there. Now, this is very, uh, very, very uh, disturbing part of it, you see. We know that slavery was there, and the Pope expressed an apology uh, for imposing a slavery. We don't have an apology from the Hindu priests or against for imposing untouchability for so many years. Now, this being the attitude, even in USA, for that, uh, for that matter, because I understand that Hindu organizations are not happy about this provision in the Brandeis University. How do you visualize, how do you see the, uh, the, your state and state by other universities, for that matter, uh, they will deal with it against this opposition? What are the chances of uh, uh, making it more widespread? Right. Uh, Professor Simon Lawrence. Thank you, Professor Thorat. Um, as far as I know, uh, we have not, at Brandeis, we have not received any direct comment from uh, Hindu organizations. The major one in the United States, as far as I'm aware, is called the American Hindu Foundation. And in fact, I even sat on a panel about a year and a half ago um, uh, that went uh, live across the nation on Facebook uh, Live and so on um, with a representative of the American Hindu Foundation and other people uh, on that panel. Um, so to begin with, we've not received any comment directly, although there have been news reports, which we have seen, where the American Hindu Foundation has criticized Brandeis for including caste in the non-discrimination policy. And basically, they see it as an attack on Hinduism. This is as far from what Brandeis is trying to do as can be. Um, 
We are a uh, non-sectarian university, as I explained in my, my talk. We um, have been from the very beginning. It was founded by Jews for, because of discrimination against Jews. But from the very beginning, we have respected, we have, um, we have uh, chaplains of all major faiths, including, uh, including uh, Hinduism on our campus. We have a large South Asian studies program. We have a large South Asian uh, community, uh, primarily Indian, but also from other South Asian nations. All uh, Hindu holidays are celebrated uh, by those students on, on campus and, um, and protected and, uh, and considered uh, absolutely appropriate on our, on, on, on our campus as our Christian holiday. <coughs> Jewish holidays and and um, and Buddhist holidays and so forth. Um, the American Hindu Foundation, as far as I I'm aware, and from what I've heard uh, from the representative who was on that panel uh, with me uh, about a year and a half ago, believes, and I may be wrong here, but this is what I understand, that um, that caste is not intrinsic to Hinduism that it is not rooted in the formation or the origins of Hinduism. I'm not gonna dispute that. I am not a, a theologian of Hinduism by any stretch of the imagination. But my point is more one of, um, of commonality. If one believes that caste is not integral to Hinduism, that Hinduism is not does not embrace or support caste, well then they should be celebrating what we have done at Brandeis. They should be celebrating a Dalit assertion movement because it's not, it, it, what we have done is to try to say that any behavior of students or anyone else on our campus that would be considered discriminatory against another student, faculty or administrator, or a faculty or administrator that would be considered discriminatory, that, that, is, that is the kind of behavior that is absolutely identical in, in, in our view to racist attitudes on, if there are racist attitudes or behavior on campus or attitudes against um, uh, 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 gender or people of different sexual orientations or any other of the protected categories, we would want to take the same action to try to A, educate people on campus, change the culture of racism or, or, or casteism or anything else and then to try to say to people that this is a community, we live together, we celebrate multiculturalism on at Brandeis University. And um, that the non-discrimination policy is educational, but also says that, that we expect certain behavior, uh, which is to uh, recognize um, and even celebrate the culture and um, um, dignity of everyone else on our, on our campus. Now we have been contacted by other universities <coughs> fairly recently in the past six months, six, uh, six weeks or two months from uh, some of the major universities around the United States asking about how we went through this, this inquiry and how we went, how we uh, determined that this should be considered in uh, we, how, how, why we put it into a non-discrimination policy. So I do expect that mm, incorporating caste into other university non-discrimination policies will come eventually. Once again, caste is not a protected category by law of any state or the federal government. Therefore, there seems there's sometimes some resistance about, well, why isn't it, if it's under law, then of course we would incorporate it. So the question that some universities ask is, do we need to show, do we need to see evidence of discrimination in our campus? And our view is, or at least my view is, no. We only need to establish that discrimination against low caste, tribal, or Dalit people in the United States does exist. And therefore, it is cause enough to, to inclu include it in our non-discrimination policies yeah. to set standards for community. Thank can, you. can I jump in here for, for thank, you, thank you thank you very much uh, 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 Lauren yes. well uh, I, I I think I will put up a last and a common question to both of you and uh, <laughs> Kevin, if you want to say something you can include that also okay. sure. uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to hear what he was <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, the the common question is uh, uh, and the first part of it is to Kevin Brown, is that uh, uh, 
if we want to uh, enhance the association between the african american organization of different types uh, a civil society organization uh, and other organizations for, for example the nwcp is such a powerful uh, country level organization being there from 1925 there is hardly any association with the indian social movement or organization right, right. Uh, so in your view what can be done and what are the prospect of uh, sort of uh, building and enhancing the cooperation between dalit and african american this is to you and to simon lawrence um, the uh, lawrence the uh, you know i think brandeis university in the history will go as a pioneering institution which has recognized caste uh, as an issue uh, uh, to be included in that particular provision there may not be discrimination as you said rightly but it is an issue at the at the country level and uh, uh, what do you think in your view can be done to sensitize the issue on caste and bring it into the uh, provisions of the university and the colleges so that the dalits at least in the universities have a non discriminatory atmosphere and favorable atmosphere can you please go ahead. yeah um so i it will allow me to to weave in my point one of the things that that, that larry mentioned was the cisco case yeah. and uh and, and I've done some work on it and working on an article with it uh, and actually even reached out to the attorneys. Um, and he, it, he's right. As of right now, there's nothing within American law that makes caste discrimination illegal. But what happened on, on June 20th of this year the U.S. Supreme Court handed down a Title VII decision that equated discrimination against gays and lesbians yes. to sex discrimination. Yes. You can pull that same argument and apply it to, to caste discrimination, only now you're analogizing it to race. Yes. So there is at least right now at least a legitimate potentially very powerful legal argument that in the context of employment discrimination, caste discrimination is, is illegal. Now, that has to be litigated. Yes. Uh, you got to take it to a court. You have to have a court find it. And the Cisco case was found by, as, as Professor Simon said, the Department um, of Fair, uh, Fair Housing and, and Employment Discrimination in California. They dismissed the federal claim a week ago Friday, yeah. but they're to refile it in state court. Yeah. And and if in fact we can 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 do this, and and, and so here's here was what I was going to suggest, uh, uh, Professor Thurai. A couple of my friends are former heads of the litigation departments of the NAACP. Oh, yeah. So I've already reached out to both of them to say, hey, look, do you think the NAACP would be interested in getting involved in this litigation? Because that litigation would highlight caste-based discrimination in the United States probably in no other way that we could do it better. Uh, because yeah. you get national coverage, and the analogy would be caste-based discrimination is race-based discrimination. <laughs> so, so we'll just have to see how that plays out. Uh, but that would be my suggestion is let's use the legal system and let's test our employment discrimination law to see if it does in fact cover caste discrimination. Yeah, uh, uh, Simon? Yes, thank, thank you. Um, I, I think Kevin is absolutely right about that. Um, it would be a, a, a terrific assist, I should think, for NAACP and other such organizations of, of many kinds, right? Many faiths and so on, you know, to 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 join that. I mean, obviously, I, I'm not privy to the details of the of the complaint and of in a lawsuit. I mean, I can't judge this. I'm not a, I'm not sitting in a court judging it. So we have to see in a fair hearing and a full in a fair court process, I mean, what the outcome is and hopefully it would be done um, you know, with due process and and, and correctly. Um, 
I think part of the problem of Professor Thorat in answer to, to your question is that caste is the hidden discrimination in America today. Um, and, and perhaps there are other hidden discriminations. Yeah. I don't doubt. I don't doubt that e either. But I say it's the hidden discrimination not because uh, universities or the state of Massachusetts or other other such entities um, are resistant to including caste. They don't know about it. They don't know about it. As yeah. They don't know about it. It's not part for the majority of Americans. I'm not talking about the South Asian immigrants who have come here or South Asians, particularly Indians, who work. On, you know, have work visas, uh, particularly in high tech firms. You know, I spent my sabbatical helping to start the Google Foundation, as Professor Thornton mentioned. And I know, even in those years, and which was um, some time ago already, the percentage of Indians who were working as as computer engineers, as software engineers, at at at, at Google. Um, and I don't mean to suggest at all that that all of them or any of them necessarily carry their caste um, uh, identities and kind of caste privilege in you know with them. I didn't know most of them, of course, very 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 well. But caste is the hidden discrimination because most of us don't come from South Asian cultures, and particularly India and Nepal, where the system is still fairly rigid compared to uh, uh, some of the other South Asian countries. They just don't know about it. So part of so yes, Professor Thorat, your question is I think right on the mark. We need as universities, as as faith-based organizations, as 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 organizations that represent uh, other discriminations, uh, like the historic work of the NACP, of course. We need to help to sensitize our constituencies. We need to sensitize the American public and our and our political leaders. Why caste is such a powerful. Uh, discrimination. It is the equivalent of white supremacy, uh, the casteism. It's the equivalent of white privilege uh, in the United States, which is a little bit more subtle, obviously, and hidden in a sense um, uh, than white supremacists parading around. Um, but uh, we need to do that. We have been trying at Brandeis, both through, as you mentioned in your introduction, we've had now five conferences that began at Brandeis. Uh, always on the theme and the subtitle is always the unfinished legacy of Dr. Bjorn Bedkar. And the first three were at Brandeis, then, it, then we decided it's, it's good to let it travel around different universities. Um, maybe in the, Indiana is coming up, I don't know. It would be wonderful. That would be great. Can I get yeah. a commitment from you? <laughs> but uh, no, no, I'm not asked. But uh, the fourth international conference uh, was at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. The fifth was just a year ago. And at the new school, um, uh, a very important uh, university in terms of social change also. Um, our, our journal is reaching audiences uh, in America that aren't just people already involved in caste. You know, so we hope by that means South Asian studies professors around the United States, and some of whom are writing for the journal now, and, and others that this may help, help to influence. And very importantly, as I mentioned, I think in, the, in my talk, encouraging, nurturing, uh, even funding, quite frankly, uh, st uh, study grants and uh, planning grants, which we can do through our endowment um, to, um, uh, to encourage uh, faculty around the United States to uh, consider developing courses to integrate CAS, to integrate Dr. Embedkar's contributions and, um, and Dalit assertion movement should be taught in, on, in courses on social movements. And Vedkar should be taught and, um, and, the, and, in, and indeed even what is somewhat painful to some, um, some people from India, uh, even the relationship between Dr. Ambedkar and uh, Mahatma Gandhi is very important part of, it's part of history. <coughs> and not included is a denial of history. It's, it's, it's at some point it becomes a willful ignorance, a willful denial of the reality uh, that has shaped our world and our cultures. And if we're going to achieve a genuine society of, res of mutual respect of all children born in, in our societies on earth, we, we, we must be able to transcend, we must be able to understand our own histories. Well, thank you very much, uh, um, Lord and Simon. Well, I, uh, you know, on behalf of our TV, I I express my profound thanks uh, for you people for sparing time and uh, sharing your thoughts. 
I would like to end this uh, uh, discussion with a happy birthday note. Uh, you know, Kevin Brown was born on 14th of October 1956, the day on which Dr. Ambedkar converted to Buddhism <laughs> here at Nagpur. And so uh, the 14th and 24th, uh, 24th, are used interchangeably. Some, some take dates, some take festivals. So very happy birthday to you. You are you were you were exactly born and and you carry the flag uh, <laughs> of the club. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you very much. Thank and you. Take care. Thank Wish you. you all the best. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you very much.